Big Jack Night. That's what we're billing it. We're doing something a little bit different on Sheffield Live TV this Thursday, but I promise you it'll be as entertaining, well, as hopefully it usually is, probably even more so, because we're going to be talking about the life and times, the career of one of the most colourful and one of the most successful English football personalities between now and around five to eight. It might even delay one or two of you from following live football on the TV tonight. Not quite sure who's playing. But there is a game, I believe. Mel Sterling, I'm going to come to him. He'll tell you exactly who is playing tonight. But obviously, I've got to put cards on the table and say this is mainly for those of a Sheffield Wednesday persuasion. And even, if you're watching in West Yorkshire, those of a Leeds United persuasion. We're going to be talking about this book, Jack Charlton, the authorised biography, with the man who wrote it with Big Jack, Colin Young, a journalist that I've had the pleasure of knowing for some years, a national newspaper journalist who's now joined the ever-expanding ranks of freelance uh, journalists, Colin. <laughs> There's too many of us out there, I'll tell you. And uh, Mel Sterland, legendary uh, former player, both for Sheffield Wednesday and Leeds United, and at uh, Sheffield Wednesday, of course, uh, Jack uh, was, near enough, your first manager. Uh, well, not quite your first manager, but the one that you had serious dealings with at the start of your career. Well, yeah, serious dealings. It, it were scary, to be honest, because <laughs> Jack was a, a great guy. Everybody loved him. And, uh, you know, I got in the first team at 17, Alan, and uh, so funny. I, I came home and I said to my dad, you know, what shall I ask for? Uh, the manager wants to come in and uh, wants me to go in and see him. So my dad said, "Bless him." He said, "That's for two hundred and fifty pounds a week." Right. So I bet that was a lot. Then. A lot of a money lot for a seventeen-year-old, anyway. Yeah, but uh, you've got to try these things, you know. I've, <laughs> you on, have to try you them. <laughs> you've, you've got to try them, Alan. Trust me. So I get the guys on the Monday morning, knocks on the door, no agent. Obviously sweating, frightened to death. Knocks on the door, come in. I open the door. Jack Chong's there. With flat cap on, cigarette. You can picture this. We can Sporting picture. Sporting life. Yeah. What's the one? And he's on, and he's reading his Sporting Life. He said, "What's the one?" I said, uh, "What about two hundred and fifty pounds a week?" And he got the cigarette in his mouth. He went, <laughs> "Is that fell on the floor?" His hat fell. His hat fell on the floor. On the, and he just turned around and he said to me, sign that or get out. And there were right. a bit of language. So I just got the pen and I signed it and I got 50 quid a week and <laughs> 60 pounds appearance of money. So, you know, it was a bit scary. So but, you, I'm disappointed, but he just caved in. I just caved in. I, I bottled it. Surprised. Oh, well, you would do. I it. bottled it because I was only yeah. a, young, young, a young kid. And, you know, many times when, you know, we used to come home from training or. Uh, and, and my dad used to say, what you been doing? Yeah. Uh, and I used to say to my dad, well, we've been beating. So <laughs> he says, what do you mean, beating? Yeah. You know, well, we've been in, in the fields with sticks. Yeah. Smashing the, so the pheasants would fly up, so Jack would shoot them. <laughs> so my dad said, well, you're going to be a footballer then, or a beater. <laughs> I, and we were just like, the guy were amazing, amazing yeah. bloke. Um, <laughs> just a funny guy, a character. And, Absolutely. You know, I loved him. I loved him. I loved and, him. And so many people in this book, <clears throat> like yourself, uh, Gary Megson's talking about him, Terry Curran's talking about him, Mick McCarthy at some length is talking about him, and they use that word as well, not like, they talk about loving him. Colin Young, um, you've had the pleasure of writing this book, and by the way, there are plenty more stories where that came from, from Mel and from Colin, about this larger-than-life character. Um, how do you find the experience of writing the, the book with Jack? Um, it was, as, as you'll know yourself, Alan, it's, you know, writing a book is a labour of love. Um, it takes over your life completely. Uh, three, four o'clock in the morning, sometimes later finishes. Mm. Don't see the wife and kids. Um, but if you're going to write a book about anybody, I, I'd consider it, a, it was a privilege, even, yeah. to, have, uh, to have written about, like you say, one of the real characters of the game. Um, and it was it, as long as those hours were, they were pleasurable because there was such a rich seam of stories from yeah. not just from uh, the different parts of the country where he's worked, which is mainly in the north, which appealed, um, and in Ireland where I've worked uh, a lot. 
That's what you but got to know him, wasn't it? For, it, it working was, with Republican yeah, Party, that, going on to as well, right. etc. Yeah, and it was yeah. it was over there that I recognised there was a cross section of people from all walks of life who, like Mel said, just just loved the guy. You know, met yeah. him maybe only once or twice, maybe mm -hmm. only in some people's case for 30 seconds and, and a minute and they would have a Jack Charlton story and just because they've been in his And that's despite this gruff exterior that he could present to the world and often, when he answers his phone, I know I've, I've been running <laughs> with him, hello, like this yeah. is discouraging to say the least, isn't it? You kind of think, well, It's <laughs> funny because a, a lot of the journalists that have worked with him over the years would have a, st would have a horror story, you know, they yeah. would have a story where they've either been given the biggest rollicking of yeah. their life or I've have, got one. have, have yeah. got one where yeah. they've, they've actually been mistaken and still gotten the rollicking or have been on the receiving end of someone else's, you know, or just as you say in the day to day dealings with him, he would be gruff and he would be to the point and he would give the impression that he actually didn't want to do the press or couldn't be bothered yeah. to give you a line for the papers or whatever. And yet the number of journalists who are close friends with him still or keep in touch with him or send him Christmas cards <coughs> and again just love the guy and that's the remarkable thing having torn is, off there the aren't many like that in the game no I don't tell know. me this does he know your name yet he knows me as the laird with the book the um, laird yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, i mean obviously i'm the laird anyway yeah. w when we went fishing for the day um because uh, it it was quite clear that jack had kind of done all he could in terms of his own memories of the game he'd written an autobi autobiography in 96 the family were looking to republish that and reprint it, but update it. Mm. And that coincided with me being asked by an Irish publisher if, if I fancied the, the idea of, of writing Jack's biography. Mm. Approached the family and everything kind of gelled in together. Um, but they wanted other people to tell the stories. They wanted me to kind of gather as many as I, yeah. as I could. And um, from there, it, it was just a, a sort of mashing all those together and knitting them all together. Um, so I took the decision if I was going to spend time with Jack, it was to do other things. Yeah. Went fishing for the day with him up in Northumberland, which was just hilarious and yeah. brilliant. And just a really <laughs> simple couple of hours, yeah. but just, just lovely to spend time with him. Did you ever go fishing with him? I didn't go fishing, but I had to clean his Range Rover out and there were trout under the sea <laughs> when we were in Apprentices, when we were young right. kids, meeting a guy called uh, Charlie Williamson. Yeah. And uh, he gave us the keys to go and clean his Range Rover out. So he Did you ever do any training when Jack was? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know how to become a footballer, to be honest. I ain't got a clue because Jack just said, do this and do that, and we did. People might think, you know, from I'm reading the book, that this was, apart from being a great character, that he wasn't serious or concentrating on the job. His record would tell you otherwise. For those who've forgotten, and obviously the book will, will remind you, what about this? Republic of Ireland never been to a, a, no, a major right. tournament before well, Jack became manager. Led them to two World Cups, 1990 and 94, and the European Championships in 98. And they did well, 80, too. 88, yeah. sorry. They beat and, England. And they bit, well, we don't, I wasn't gonna, you, you mentioned Sorry, that, but I was going to say that. Uh, f football club manager, promotion with Middlesbrough in 1974, established them in the top flight. Sheffield Wednesday, six years in the job. That didn't half seem a long time now. Mm, yeah. 77 to 83, got them promotion and then knocking on the door of, uh, of the top flight. As a player, title winner at Leeds United, World Cup winner, of course, with England in 66. You know, I mean, this is a, a massive, massive achiever. So, you know, and you, you do wonder, don't you, Colin, looking at all of that, and you say, how, how did he do it? How did he do it? What's your view of it? Um, I think, first of all, d despite the, 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 the tales that Mel tells and stuff, he, yeah. will, he will know also he was very, very serious about his job. And there were times, I'm sure, Graeme Souness mentions it in the book, that um, you knew where you, that there was a time for work and a time for play. Yeah. And in fact, uh, I think Terry Curran was signed in a nightclub in Leeds. Uh, soon as again mentioned that they would go out for a night out around Middlesbrough and Jack would be in the same bars and the same clubs. Yeah. Um, but when they, went, when they were on the training ground, he, they knew what, the players knew where they stood. And also, he had a fairly rudimentary style of football, I think it's fair to say. Um, but it was effective and the players again knew where they stood and if you didn't play by his rules or you weren't willing to um, adhere to the way that he wanted the football to be played, he didn't play, it was as simple as that and so yeah. there was no tippy-tappy, bearing in mind the pitches didn't allow tippy-tappy no, anyway in those no, days, no. let's be honest, but there was no messing around in midfield, the ball got forward and the centre forward and his mate chased That's after right. it. Well, no we frills. We played at QPR on the Astro pitch oh. and um, 
this is how long it is. And Jack, well, yeah. Jack was obviously the manager. And he said to us, listen, I don't want nobody to try and pass the ball. He said, what I want you to do is flick the ball in the air, <laughs> flick yeah. it up and boot it Lovely. as high as you can in the air and we'll win the game. And we won the game 1-0. We never passed the ball at all. We just no. lumped it in the air and, and the forwards got onto it. Cole just said, yeah. unbelievable. He got the results and you know, everybody wanted to play for him. Yeah, and and yet they've had rocks with him, fights with him. In some cases, we're going to come onto a fight. There's a proper fight that most of them witnessed during his days at, uh, at Sheffield Wednesday. That's right, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was a good fight as well. To be honest, I was yeah. only a young young kid. I just got like I said, I just got in the first team, and you know, this particular day, it were it were uh, very very cold and icy, and so we had to go into the gym, yeah. and um, we all got around. And Jack Charlton said to Terry Curran, "Listen, I want you to play on the wing." And Terry Curran says, I'm not playing on the wing. I don't want to play on the wing. And Jack Charlton, in his language, said, yet you are going to play on the wing. And Terry Curran said, I'm not playing on the wing. Next minute, Jack went up to him with his red face, and he got his big sheepskin coat. I'll never forget it. And Terry Curran just threw a punch. And next minute, Jack threw a punch, and he was scrapping. And they both fell on the floor. And next, I was just watching it. I thought, go on then, have a good fight. Go on, yeah. go on get into it. <laughs> and next minute, all the players just dived in and, and split them up. And That's disappointed you then. Right? I were gutted. I yeah. were gutted like. You're the only one. There's Colin, <laughs> Colin's book quotes 20 players diving in to break them up. Uh, there were 21 there. Yeah. You were the one that was standing <laughs> watching. I was the one that was watching. I needed yeah. another contract. Young I was only yeah, but, a kid. but Terry speaks. I mean, Terry's been out on the show talking. Yeah. He, he loved uh, Jack, and Jack got some of the best football of his career out of him, including the Boxing Day massacre performance against Sheffield United. Uh, TC were a great footballer, oh, you know. Yeah. And, and like you said, he, he produced the goods for for Jack because Jack, yeah. you know, they used to go out and have a pint together, and yeah. uh, you know, and, and have a laugh in the crowd. Mr. Cole said, so that's how Jack. That's how he worked. Well, that's how I got my one rollicking because of those two. <laughs> I was watching them play snooker one day. At the, uh, so they used to have like a social club at Hillsborough. And I had to wait. I was <coughs> working for Radio Hull and waiting with my tape recorder for them to finish this game of snooker. But a row broke out over a rule of free shot or something. <laughs> and Jack stomped over and said, get this on tape. You know, he can't have a free shot because of this. And Terry came over and said, I can because of X, Y, and Z. <laughs> so Jack said... I want you to sort this out there, you know, back at the, when you go back, back to work. So I said, well, I know the world snooker promoter. What Jack didn't know was I was going to put it on the radio, you see. <laughs> so I put it on the radio and got the world snooker promoter to adjudicate. Jack stuck his neck out too far. He's lost the bet. He owes Terry a fiver. That is why I got the rollicking. Did he get the fiver? Yeah, well, I'm, I doubt it. I doubt it. No chance. Had Jack won that bet, I would not have heard any more about it. As it was, he was absolutely <laughs> furious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then he said, now yeah. what do you want? Which is typical, you know, move on. Mark Lawrenson, I was talking to the other day, reminded me of something that you've got in this book as well, which was when Jack's players, when Jack first became Ireland manager, the players would, I think, be in the habit of turning up for training at 10 or something of a Monday morning, having, so, let's say, socialised the previous day. And mm. Jack was... Uh, annoyed, but not not because they come in bleary eyed, but because he'd not been invited to the previous. No, place. it was uh, he was clever uh, in that one of the things he recognised was he had to make international football a pleasure for those that were representing Ireland. So yeah. that he built up very very quickly the camaraderie and the squad togetherness. And one of the things that happened prior to him taking over um, was Owen Hand was was the manager and I think Johnny Giles before that and there used to be a group of Dublin born players who were quite high powered the likes of Stapleton Brady and people like this um, and they would meet up with the squad and then disappear and go back to the family so Sunday night after after because obviously it was 3 yeah. p.m. Saturday in those days yeah. so Sunday night they get into Dublin and go straight off then, they, like you say, they'd be back in on Monday morning, do a bit of a session, and then straight off to see the families again. And there used to be a pool of Opal cars waiting for these senior players to, to drag them on. Now, the, um, the likes of Mick McCarthy, Chris Hewton, lads who were maybe English-born and didn't have Irish families, they would be sat around the hotel on their own, waiting for these lads to come back in yeah. so they could have a training session and then waiting for the game. So this was, in, Jack basically witnessed this in his first game mm. in charge of Ireland, I think it was against Wales, and then just said, never again. 
you meet with the squad on Sunday night at a certain time. We go out to the cinema maybe on Sunday night, or maybe a pint, a few yeah. pints Sunday night. Um, cinema might have been Monday, but the squad stayed together until the last ball was kicked, yeah. probably on the Wednesday. Then they'd have a couple of pints again on the Wednesday night, and then you then you leave, then you disperse. So and he made that the case for the 10 years that he was in charge. It never yeah. changed. And that camaraderie, that togetherness was such that you'd have people like Bernie Slavin and John Byrne would be turning up injured just because they like the crack and they like, yeah. you know, they like, they like the togetherness of that squad. And it didn't do them any harm over the years, that's for how sure. Did, how did he manage, Mel, how did he manage to be the boss and one of the boys, at, at, you know, almost at one and the same well, he just got time? The, he just got the knack, you know. So everybody wanted to play for him. Mm. You know, you, you got somebody like that, and you know, a genuine guy. Yeah, um, he liked people. That came across. Loved people. Uh, you know, it didn't matter who you were, cleaner, you know, so, scaffolder. Yeah, he'd speak to you. Fisherman, whatever. He'd, he would speak to you. He, yeah. he were a gentleman, as well as you know, he, he could be ruthless. You know, mm. but hey, listen, he got results. You look at his uh, his career, what he's had. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. When you played for Leeds, and of course you won the second division, and you you won the league as well at, uh, at Leeds in your time there with uh, Howard Wilkinson. How aware were you of that history that Jack played a part in with that great team under Don Don Reedy? Well, I see uh, Terry Orrith and Paul Reaney and uh, Mick Jones, and they yeah. <laughs> I always have a crack with them saying that we we beat them. You know, our, yeah. our, our team <laughs> would beat them, and we won it. Just mess it about, and yeah. uh, I, I don't think we would. Um, you know, because they'd got some magnificent players. Yeah. You know, and we we just went there, and like I said, we we were we Howard Wilkinson. Howard Wilkinson were a great manager as well. Um, very different. Very different. Absolutely very different. Well, <laughs> Wilco, we couldn't go out anyway. <laughs> he wouldn't be out there boozing <laughs> with you. Would he? No, I would wouldn't be. I would would be uh, probably fining us. I would have thought. Yeah. Jack used to go and have a pint with her and say, so long as you produce the goods. Yeah. You know, Jack was very happy. And he rounded on a player, Colin, in there for drinking coke because he said that Guinness was far better Guinness for was you. Better for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I would. No. Why <laughs> yeah. would you? No. Yeah. Why would you disagree it's just with unusual that? Unusual for a football the manager. <laughs> it is right? yeah. on the eve well, of a game. A yeah. Well, the, the colours the same. Yeah. It's just I think the thing was that that, it, that particular thing referred again to the camaraderie of the Irish team. And obviously, <coughs> when you're away, especially if you're at a tournament. You're away from your family, away from your mates for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And again, I think he just took the view that as long as you perform on the pitch for me, as long as you yeah. don't take the mick in terms of your your um, your, your consumption of alcohol, but they two did pints for you with your meal. <laughs> well, they would do, <laughs> but equally, they still um, produce for him. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And Mick, um, yeah. Mick McCarthy does mention in the book that he once said to Jack. Did you not hear us when we used to come back at three, four in the morning? Because <laughs> Morris and, and Jack used to have the rooms at the end of the corridor in yeah. the hotel yeah. airport in, near Dublin, which yeah. is invariably where they stayed. So, you know, if they'd been to Lily's till three, four in the morning, the taxi come back and you'd have them all bumbling <laughs> in. And of course, at that time in the morning, you do tend to think you're quieter than you actually are. <laughs> you know, um, and, he'd, he'd, and Jack would have the door open quite a lot of the time, you know, so he yeah. must have heard them. And Mick would say, oh, did you never hear us coming back? And Jack said, yeah, of course I did, but why would I want to go finding trouble? Why would I want to go finding yeah. a fight with you lot? As long as you produce for me on the pitch, as long as everybody got in at a reasonable time, as long as nothing untoward happened, yeah. I was in control. This is yeah. like common sense management, <laughs> isn't it, really? Good management. Very, yeah, yeah. Very good management. Yeah. And Mick obviously took over from Jack and kind of learned a little bit about about that style of management although <coughs> I think there were it was difficult for Mick in some ways in that um, football was starting to change it was yeah. becoming more professional if yeah. that's the right word and by the time Mick took over he had to get rid of all the fans because the fans used to stay in the same hotel as the, right. as the team yeah. and you'd be in it didn't matter whether you were in Rimini or Rill, yeah. there would be punters absolutely everywhere. And Mick had to say, right, I've got to curb that. I've got, But there were still I, elements I, of Jack's management he definitely I, learned. I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to stop you because that first 20 minutes has flown by. Just about, We've got 24 minutes to come uh, in five minutes' time. Do not miss that, including how Jack coined the flying pig tag for Big Mel here and how that came about. James Gregg joins us as well. Colin Young, Mel Sterling. And do rejoin us in five. See you then. Bye.